And Robert will uh, invoke the sea with the poems, and Stefan will respond. And then we'll, we'll open it up to uh, the audience um, after we've gone through the eight poems, I think. Yeah. yeah? I, wonder, so, I wonder, Stefan, if you, I'm happy to just begin by reading a couple of poems. I wonder fine. if you want to say anything about sound, the ocean, and poetry first, or should I just read, read a bit? I think reading sounds so Okay. Uh, I'll read two poems, one quite short to begin. And um, they both associate the ocean with imagination, uh, with transforming. And throughout the first little short eight or nine line poem by Shakespeare, and the other ocean as a word carries a tremendous weight. The Shakespeare is perhaps the most central, in English, the most central writing about the ocean. Much quoted, much imitated, much alluded to. The Song from the Tempest, the only play in which Shakespeare made up his own story. No one's ever found a source for the Tempest. Mm. Every other story he got from sources. And uh, it's his last play, and it's very much about the ocean. Full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him that doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. Sea nymphs hourly ring his knell. Ding dong, hark, now I hear them. Ding dong, bell. And I'll read Edwin Arlington Robinson's Eris. Tyrannos, which ends in the ocean. And as I've said, the word ocean is very central in it. In a way, what I have to con contribute to this conversation is technical about poetry. I think of this poem as a hyper ballad. Ballads often involve nature as a context for human agonies and strivings. Ballads very much so. And uh, well, you'll hear, I think, what I'm talking about, the remarkable sounds in this poem. Eros Ternos means love the tyrant, love the ruler. And he basically tells the story of a woman who has to choose between a love affair that she knows will be a disaster, it will be horrible, or on the other hand, no love affair at all. Guess what she chooses? <laughs> Eros Turnos. She fears him and will always ask what fated her to choose him. She meets in his engaging mask all reasons to refuse him. But what she meets and what she fears are less than are the downward years drawn slowly to the foamless weirs of age were she to lose him. Between a blurred sagacity that once had power to sound him and love that will not let him be the Judas that she found him, her pride assuages her almost, as if it were alone the cost. He sees that he will not be lost and waits and looks around him. A sense of ocean and old trees envelops and allures him. Tradition, touching all he sees, beguiles and reassures him, and all her doubts of what he says are dimmed with what she knows of days, till even prejudice delays and fades, and she secures him. The falling leaf inaugurates the reign of her confusion. The pounding wave reverberates the dirge of her illusion, and home where passion lived and died, becomes a place where she can hide while all the town and harbor side vibrate to her seclusion. We tell you, tapping on our brows, the story as it should be, as if the story of a house were told or ever could be. We'll have no kindly veil between her visions and those we have seen as if we guessed what hers have been, or what they are, or would be. Meanwhile, we do no harm. For they that with a God, for they that with a God have striven, 
not hearing much of what we say, take what the God has given, though like waves breaking it may be, or like a changed familiar tree, or like a stairway to the sea where down the blind are driven. Pretty good, if I may say so. <laughs> <clears throat> I can't follow that. <laughs> I've been scrivening. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. I mean, a sense of ocean and old yeah. trees envelops and allures him. A sense of ocean. Uh, it's such a great use of a noun that means almost everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm struck by the... Um, the line that once had power to sound him, and the multiplicity of meanings which sound has as listening, as hearing, as testing, as assaying, or... or and it's a nautical term. Right. And, the, and I guess there's a double etymology to the word sound that we have, at least in English, where on the one hand, it comes from uh, the Old English svin, which... Um, is about songs. And then there's another one which escapes my mind at the moment, but it's about depth, yeah. right? And so there's this double, there's this pun that's available uh -huh. in English, which is sort of a great coincidence and a gift to us, those of us who play with that language, um, that you can make this, you can have these meanings reverberate yeah. through the poem. So I'm, I'm really fascinated in the specificity of the materials of, Engli of the English language that that are afforded here, and the genealogies that you can kind of spin out from these words. I'm also struck, um, I was thinking about this a little bit earlier. I was thinking about simile and reading through these poems and the moments in which, in many of these poems, one thing is likened to another. And I got obsessed with figuring out uh, something about the word like, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That the operate, that the, the is this, a, is this a word, similitic? The similitic operator. Similitudinous? <laughs> the similitudinous. The similitudinous <laughs> operator of like. Um, so, I, uh, so according to the OED, the word like is inherited into English from the German and is cognate with Old Frisian gelik, Old Dutch gelik, Middle Dutch gelich, um, Old Saxon gelik, and... Um, and that ge prefix in gelike, apparently, um, which was rendered in the earlier German as ye, seems to mean fitting or well-suited or together with, kind of like, well, as in a-like, <laughs> a-like. And that like itself was archaic, archaically lich, meaning body or sometimes form or sometimes corpse. Mm -hmm. And so with that ge kind of swallowed, <laughs> Um, like might mean something like with fitting form or body, so that there is life and body and maybe death inside of the word like itself, which very much fits the ocean, which is also about and life which and he, bodies. Hates, which he uses twice in the last three lines. Mm. Yeah, well, so like, maybe, maybe this like is... Like a stairway I'm, to sea or like a change familiar tree or like a stairway to the sea. Yeah, so maybe I'm late to the like game. But, um, but this complete, I, I, I sort of became fascinated by not just the, the, uh, the operation of simile, but what is, the, what is the English language word that does that, and, and what are the unexpected things inside of it? This may be a little pedantic and aside from the point, but I can't resist because you talked about the Germanic nature mm. of the word like, that this particular poem does a drama that I think is one of the dramas of English poetry. You know, English has a larger vocabulary than French, Spanish, German, because it's a, it's a polyglot, it's a hybrid, mm -hmm. mongrelized language. And there's always a drama in any piece of English writing between the Latin roots, mm -hmm. which give us words like jurisprudence and torture and spiritual, and the Germanic roots, mm -hmm. which give us words like foot, food, and like. Mm -hmm. And in this poem, familiar tree, Latin, German. Mm -hmm. The falling leaf inaugurates. So you have adjective noun, the leaf, 
inaugurates mm -hmm. uh, the Latin uh, between a blurred sagacity. It's almost like a trick that he does each time that it feels like a delicious contrast because blurred sagacity, um, tradition touching. Mm -hmm. They're uh, a noun participle. Uh, she secures him. And you could, the wave reverberates. Mm -hmm. And it, the unlikeness mm -hmm. of the two kinds of root are part of what gives the poem both a sense of richness and attention. Mm -hmm. And you could say it's, it's like sound and sound. Yeah, uh, right. Yeah, like that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, just because I'm a total amateur, and I'm, an, I'm a lowly anthropologist. But there is that, um, that pun that one can make on the word root, right? Yeah. That it's both, there's sort of this tree metaphor that gives us the idea that words have roots and come from this kind of arborescent ground. Mm. But then if you sort of make the pun about roots as paths of travel, then of course there's this kind of way in which these languages are not only differently rooted, but they're entangled and cross-wired and <laughs> cross-traveling. And, yeah. and I also am in love with false cognates because they're these wonderful tricksters, yeah. right? That you kind of want to do the due diligence of figuring out, yes, there are these two different etymologies to the word sound. I've got them. And then and now I can see that the poem is messing with them. But then there's this yeah. wonderful thing that sort of exceeds even that kind of. Um, like, like the adverb and like the verb, like mm -hmm. the verb. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't, I won't stop, I'll stop soon, but engaging mask. Mm -hmm. And often it takes the sexual part of the poem is reflected in the Latin and Germanic. Mm -hmm. Engaging mask, familiar tree. And the tree, is it like a family or is it like the trees? You know? mm -hmm. And um, a familiar tree and blurred sagacity, there's something almost sexual in the taking the two kinds of language. Mm. And often there's a, a sexual, in the case of engaging mask, mm -hmm. uh, engagement I guess can be engaging in battle or engaging in an embrace, uh, but engaging mask it tells a lot of the story of the poem. He has an engaging mask and they get engaged and he gets their house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was wondering if we could um, talk a little bit about the, the, the Tempest um, sure. in any way if you would like to, just because, um, I don't know, it seems really, uh, it seems to like contain the ocean and if inside I were little, this yeah, little poem. If I were more scholarly, I would know if this poem is the first time that sea change is used in English. Mm. Uh, and it then, becomes something we say quite a lot. Mm. And the ocean is like imagination, it's also like poetry. Mm. Uh, nothing of him that doth fade, which is like the Yeats, whatever is begotten, born and dies. Mm. Things that are mutable <sighs> and mortable mm. then need to be transformed. Mm. And they're tra transformed in this poem into things that are more beautiful than they were. Coral is more beautiful than bone. The pearls are more beautiful than the eyes, as well as more enduring. Mm. And uh, your father, it means something in the play, in the actual uh, plot, in which it turns out the father is not dead. Um, but it also means you are descended from a long line of mortals. Mm. And you will join them and the past will be transformed. Right. And the transformation of the o ocean here is in a way restorative and in a way deadly. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, right. And yeah, we, we were talking when Stefan and I met a couple months ago about how our relationship to the ocean has changed so much. Like it would be, it was only a place of terror. We didn't think we could kill it. Right, in a way, only... this whole literary heritage and artistic <laughs> heritage, it's only recently that as with the whole planet, with air, with things that seemed Benign. immutable yeah. and superhuman, mm -hmm. it turns out, not only we can, but we have 
yeah. done them terrific damage. Yeah. So the word coral f for uh, here in the 21st century has a vibration it couldn't have had in the mm -hmm. 16th century where coral is something that lasts forever mm -hmm. and we think of coral as something that we're losing. Mm -hmm. It's dissolving mm -hmm. because of us. Next. <laughs> Let's do another one. Um, I have sort of literary things to say about this next, what I'll read next, which is from Robert Hayden's uh, much longer poem, uh, The Middle Passage. And uh, the, this is the second or third section of The Middle Passage. And the f spaces in that first line that looks like a title in the last line, thou who walked on Galilee, Pilot, oh, pilot me. There's probably somebody here who could actually sing the, uh, the hymn. There are a couple of hymns, actually, I looked it up, that he is quoting at the beginning that uh, Christ worked, walked on the water, and therefore Christ will be my pilot, is the figurative mm. aspect of the hymn. Thou who walked on Galilee, quote, Deponent further saith the Bella J left the Guinea coast with cargo of 500 blacks and odd for the barracoons of Florida. That there was hardly room between decks for half the sweltering cattle stowed spoon fashion there, that some went mad of thirst and tore their flesh and sucked the blood. That crew and captain lusted with the comeliest of the savage girls kept naked in the cabins. That there was one they called the Guinea Rose, and they cast lots and fought to lie with her. That when the bosun piped all hands, the flames spreading from starboard already were beyond control, the Negroes howling and their chains entangled with the flames that the burning blacks could not be reached, that the crew abandoned ship, leaving their shrieking negresses behind, that the captain perished drunken with the wenches, further deponent saith not, end quote, pilot, oh, pilot me. The material is so strong and um, the temperature is so high in it that maybe I'll try to cool it down by making a technical observation. I'm afraid that, I never agree with people who say, oh, nobody reads poetry anymore. I did a whole project. You go to the website, favoritepoem.org. There's lots and lots of people of all kinds of professions, ethnicities, ages, read poetry. I am concerned that people have forgotten how to read with their ears. Mm. That people don't know how to hear sounds when they read. I'm warning you that one of the worst things you can say to me is, oh, I love how you read poetry aloud. The greatest insult you can say to me is, oh, I read your poem and I didn't get it, but when I hear you read it, it's so great. That's terrible. <laughs> That's very bad because I'm not trying to put something there that isn't there. I'm trying to show you that there is something written in there that you can hear. And we won't take a poll, but Robert Hayden was a master technician. I think he was a great poet as well. But his chops, his training, his technical expertise, and this poem, very cunningly, is largely in blank verse. There's, there, most of these lines are iambic pentameter, or they're a fragment of the pentameter. There are two or three foot. Of the savage girls kept naked in the cabin, the expensive spirit and a waste of shame. That there was one they called the Guinea Rose, my heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains. And they cast lots and fought to lie with her. Now is the winter of our discontent. Hmm that the burning blacks could not be reached, leaving their shrieking negresses behind. That is no country for old men, the young. This is a basic measure, and he's using it. 
he interrupts it somewhat, but that there was hardly room tweet that there was hardly room tweeting decks for half. The, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she. You know, it's it's that same cadence, and um, that there was one they called the Guinea Rose, is just a great nut line of pentameter. Uh, and it's one of the things that invisibly gives this piece of writing that he's adapted. He found a document, and he versified mm -hmm. the document, uh, not by just where he breaks it typographically, but by rearranging the syllables to make that uh, fundamental useful pulse of pentameters. So that's my technical uh, uh, sermon. The temperature is really high in, in this poem, as you've pointed out. And, and this was something we, we spoke about as we were um, conjuring what this event might be about, um, that the ocean, the sea, is a very different kind of space and depth for different sorts of people and different sorts of histories. And yes. it's, it's useful and essential, I think, to remember that as we kind of scout for the ways that it's been brought into representation. Um, so I'm an anthropologist, which means that I think about humans <laughs> and humans in their variety and in their difference. And and in their encounter with something that we sometimes call nature, right? And the ocean is often understood to be one of the most, the, one of, there it is, there's, uh, is, is understood to be kind of the wildest or the most exterior sort of nature that there is, at the same time that people have quite intimate relations with the ocean either that, that range from the kind of sublimely pleasurable to the sublimely terrifying. And so I'm interested in the ways that things like the ocean or oceans get racialized, uh, become imbued with ideas about sex or about gender or about other kinds of social position. Um, and so for me, this poem is very powerful because of its particular the story that it tells about the about the middle passage and about the triangle trade and about that kind of um, and, and the and the multiplicities of experience for people who have have been brought in captivity across the ocean. Mm. Um, there are other poems and there are other moments that are about the depths of the ocean and about drowning and about. Um, and about the sea as a kind of grave. Um, and, and this is sort of an interesting thing, th poem that sort of stays on the surface, and yet the, the depth of, and, and the, the falling into death is always there. Yeah. This passage of the poem, Hayden himself is bringing the temperature down and making it up mm. both mm -hmm. by having this be a legal jargon. Yeah. The opponent saith. And it's all in quotation marks. And uh, it's not a particularly uh, sympathetic or uh, mm -hmm. dramatic. It's, it's in the language of uh, documentation, mm -hmm. uh, which gives it that combined with the pentameter gives it its power. Mm -hmm. That on the one hand, the poem is spoken by somebody who is just documenting something as part of a court hearing, mm -hmm. a proceeding. And on the other hand, it's the cadences of Shakespeare and Milton. Mm -hmm. The other poem about the Middle Passage that we thought about using is Derek Walcott's poem, uh, which has this image in it. Derek has an image of uh, these captive Africans inscribing into the timbers of the ship their names, mm -hmm. name that might that you might never be called again. Mm -hmm. It was the anthropology, the cultural part mm -hmm, of it, mm -hmm. that there is that name that is your identity, and that will, that will be effaced, that will be abandoned. 
that will not be used for you ever again. Mm -hmm. and, and then the poetry becomes this kind of switching point between the intimate and as you were saying here, this kind of, there's a sort of perversity, right, in this about this sort of bringing the bureaucratic into this, yes. which is kind of amazing and yeah. just and jaw dropping. Framing it with the, with the uh, Christian uh, yeah. hymn, which uh, Galilee, I believe, is freshwater. It is a lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, though we call mm -hmm. it the Sea mm -hmm. of Galilee. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, uh, I can picture Hayden liking that as one of the ironies. Mm. Uh, about this uh, pious framework, uh, the, my pilot, uh, pious framework around the legalistic jargon mm -hmm. uh, presenting uh, gang rape, uh, going mad of thirst and mm -hmm. cutting yourself and drinking the blood. Uh, and it has these two uh, ineffective containers let's call them, mm. the legal jargon mm. and the Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I would say the third container, the iambic pentameter, uh, the sound mm. is the one that is the most effective. Mm -hmm. And also, and the ship, the container, yes. the ship is the container yep. which is yeah. failing also. I mean, it mm. all fails, right? Because yes. they perish. Yes, abandoned. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll talk about Latin and Germanic here. The captain perished drunken with the wenches is all Germanic. Mm. For the deponent saith not. And deponent is the, uh, I mean, I, I was quoting a kind of, when I said the words that come from the French, all the words like torture and dungeon <laughs> came from the Norman invasion. Mm -hmm. uh, and our, our legal, legal terms tend to as well. Mm -hmm. What would you like to read next? Um, well, how about, again, doing a short one and a longer okay. one? I'll read the Dickinson. Great. And then Elizabeth Bishop. OK. And then we sh should leave time for The Want Bone by Robert mm. Pinsky. Okay. Yeah, well, maybe after we have questions yeah. or something. Okay. <laughs> I never saw more, I never saw the sea. Yet know I how the heather looks and what a billow be. I never spoke with God nor visited in heaven, yet certain am I of the spot as if the checks were given. And uh, I believe checks means, uh, it's not a bank check, uh, checks is what you call a train ticket. So your, your, your pet, your credential or your that you deserve to go there. And uh, in the part of her mind that sensed that she was a great poet, uh, she must have been aware of what for me is the most powerful part of the poem, I never saw the sea. Mm. You know, we think of anybody who lives in, uh, <laughs> at any, you know, she never saw the sea and it's part of the, uh, available technology and the customs of her time. But coming from Emily Dickinson, it's, she never saw the sea. At the fish houses, it evokes the power of the ocean so gradually and doesn't go far out or I'm quoting Frost now, where he says, that they cannot see in far, out far, they cannot see in deep. But when was that ever a bar to any watch they keep? The mm. people along the sand all turn and point one way. They turn their back on the land and look at the sea all day. In that poem, he says, they cannot see out far, they cannot see in deep. But when was that ever a bar to any watch they keep? Mm. And Bishop here, she's talking about the ocean from a dock. And what's remarkable to me, to return to my thing of technique in the poem, is the poem is so quiet. It's a, and then at the end, it gets so large and high, and you're not even sure how she got there. At the fish houses, 
although it is a cold evening. Down by one of the fish houses, an old man sits netting, his net in the gloaming almost invisible, a dark purplish brown, and his shuttle worn and polished. The air smells so strong of codfish, it makes one's nose run and one's eyes water. The five fish houses have steeply peaked roofs and narrow cleated gangplanks slant up to storerooms in the gables for the wheelbarrows to be pushed up and down on. All is silver, the heavy surface of the sea, swelling slowly as if considering spilling over, is opaque, but the silver of the benches, the lobster pots and masts scattered among the wild jagged rocks is of a transparent translucence like the small old buildings with an emerald moss growing on their shoreward walls. The big fish tubs are completely lined with layers of beautiful herring scales, and the wheelbarrows are similarly plastered with creamy iridescent coats of mail, with small iridescent flies crawling on them. Up on the little slope behind the houses, set in the sparse bright sprinkle of grass, is an ancient wooden capstan, cracked, with two long bleached handles and some melancholy stains, like dried blood, where the ironwork has rusted. The old man accepts a lucky strike. He was a friend of my grandfather. We talk of the decline in the population and of codfish and herring while he waits for a herring boat to come in. There are sequins on his vest and on his thumb. He has scraped the scales, the principal beauty, from an unnumbered fish with that black old knife, the blade of which is almost worn away. Down at the water's edge, at the place where they haul up the boats, up the long ramp descending into the water, thin silver tree trunks are laid horizontally across the gray stones, down and down at intervals of four or five feet. Cold, dark, deep, and absolutely clear, element bearable to no mortal, to fish and seals. One seal particularly I have seen here evening after evening. He was curious about me. He was interested in music, like me, a believer in total immersion. So I used to sing him Baptist hymns. I also sang, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He stood up in the water and regarded me steadily, moving his head a little. Then he would disappear, then suddenly emerge almost in the same spot with a sort of shrug as if it were against his better judgment. Cold, dark, deep, and absolutely clear, the clear, gray, icy water. Back behind us, the dignified tall firs begin bluish, associating with their shadows. A million Christmas trees stand waiting for Christmas. The water seems suspended above the rounded gray and blue-grain stones. I have seen it over and over, the same sea, the same slightly, indifferently swinging above the stones, icily free above the stones, above the stones and then the world. If you should dip your hand in, your wrist would ache immediately, your bones would begin to ache, and your hand would burn as if the water were a transmutation of fire that feeds on stones and burns with a dark gray flame. If you tasted it, it would first taste bitter, then briny, then surely burn your tongue. It is like what we imagine knowledge to be, dark, salt, clear, moving, utterly free, drawn from the cold, hard mouth of the world, derived from the rocky breast forever, flowing and drawn, and since our knowledge is historical, flowing and flown. Wow. <laughs> and that last line, one doesn't notice it, but flowing and flown, it's two different verbs. It's like Shakespeare. The writer who does strokes of language like that, that are so inventive and yet seem completely natural. It's two different words. Flown is from fly, and flowing is flow, and she flow, and since our knowledge is historical, flowing and flown. And um, the verse is like the water. 
at first it's just water. And then you imagine putting your hand in, you imagine ta mm -hmm. tasting it, and it's like a transmutation of fire. Mm -hmm. And she does that with those repetitions where it's, you know, it's, it's Beethoven or something. It just <laughs> keeps going. That's amazing. Hmm? That's amazing. Yeah, it's an amazing poem. Um, I'm thinking about the relationship to the seal. <laughs> the poem is called Dark, Deep, and Absolutely Clear. Mm -hmm. As opposed to about the fish houses. <laughs> <laughs> well, she seems to be just playing around, oh, a thousand Christmas trees stand waiting for Christmas. Yeah. And it's just, it's cold, dark, deep, and absolutely clear, like what we imagine mm -hmm. knowledge to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of devastating in yeah. a way, mm -hmm. what we imagine knowledge to be. But then there's a different imagination of what the seal imagines the water yes. to be. So that yeah. so there's this kind of wonderful uh, dissonance between her sense of what the sea is for her and her sense of what the sea is for the seal. Yes. So he was curious about me. He was interested in music, like me, a believer in total immersion. <laughs> but the immersion is very different for the human than it is for the seal. Indeed. And even for humans, historically, I mean, immersion used to be a terrifying thing. And of course, there is still that with the notion of baptism. But yeah, that's yeah. also so meant to be sort of liberating. But I think m many people who think about swimming uh, these days, would, would imagine that immersion is a kind of wondrous kind of communion yeah. with the sea, yeah, and, which is something that's yeah. only available as an affect to have if you like it, okay. right? Or if you know how to swim or know how not to drown. So immersion is terrifying if you don't know how to swim, but immersion can be kind of wonderful and liberating if you think that you are becoming dolphin or something. So and that's, and that's just really wonderful with that line that our knowledge is historical, right? Our experience of what immersion is, is also a historical one. Yeah. And also, you know, different between different kinds of people, different moments of human history, and certainly the difference between humans and seals, right? Yeah. And so that's just lovely of, you know, trying to kind of daring to, to sing this song to the seal who knows better than she does about what I the totally sea agree. might be about. And the, the precision, the the laughing at her own fussy precision. Mm -hmm. A believer in total immersion, so I used to sing him Baptist hymns. Right. <laughs> I also sang A Mighty Fortress is Our God, right. which is not a Baptist hymn, mm -hmm. as though the seal wants the sort of theological or sectarian right. accuracy in what, <laughs> what, mm -hmm. what you're singing. Yeah. Um, when you said that about immersion, I thought about as Deborah said, I grew up uh, in an ocean town. Long Branch, its slogan is America's first seashore resort. Here at the MFA, you can see a wonderful Winslow Homer entitled Long Branch, New Jersey. That's my hometown. And uh, I, th when I was reading the Shakespeare Full Fathom Five to you, and with this poem you're thinking of it, uh, Stefan has this wonderful essay about uh, listening to seashells and how we explain to one another that it's not, uh, uh, pe people say it's the sound of the ocean. Nobody ever really thinks it's the sound of the ocean. It's the sound of your blood, which it's not in the least. <laughs> so we have those two myths. Mm -hmm. As he says, it's the more sciency is his mm -hmm. word, of the myths. Um, I, growing up, I believed, and I believe I still believe, though it probably is not true, that going into the ocean, I, I can't disabuse myself of this. Mm -hmm. Well, he, any little nick you have, any little defect in your body, it'll get better much faster mm -hmm. if you jump in salt water. And I swear you can feel it. Ah, oh, I'm in the ocean. I can, I can feel any little scratch or bump healing faster mm -hmm. because I'm in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So I'm a believer in therapeutic immersion. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, so the, yeah, the association of the ocean with health is an association. Right. Yeah. And right. I mean, certainly that was behind things like the beachside vacation, the sort of, before people were swimming, they were bathing. I mean, so thinking about yeah. beachside vacations in France or in England in the 18th, 18th and 19th century, you know, the idea was that you would go take the waters and not only would you bathe, but you would also drink it, right? Okay. So. 
There are stories about Charles Darwin drinking salt water as kind of a cure for what ailed him, right? So this association with, with health goes quite, quite deep. And yeah. you know, it has its historical moments when people really buy into it or think about it in that way. When President Garfield was shot in Washington by a crazy man named Guiteau, who's always described as a frustrated office seeker, that's part of the yeah. fact that we wanted to kill Guiteau and did. He's totally crazy. The office he was seeking was ambassador to France. Um, Garfield lingered a very long time and um, he probably died of infection. Every doctor in the country wanted to uh, poke their finger in and find where the bullet was. The bullet was found harmlessly in cyst. They didn't know about sepsis. Uh, despite the Civil War, all those casualties, all the things, they didn't, still didn't know mm -hmm. about sepsis. So these big shot doctor of uh, Arlington, Mass, or Belmar, New Jersey, would say, I would examine the president. Didn't wash his hands. Probably shook hands with one another a lot and then examined the president. Mm -hmm. Well, what I'm building up to is that the Potomac swamps were malarial. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. It was the summer. It was July, then August. So they made a special train car. Uh, the Army engineers put ice in the train car. and They had a, 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 they carried his mattress out to the train. They had an extra train going ahead to tell people to be quiet, not to disturb the president. And the train went from Washington, D.C to where Garfield was actually intending to go when he was shot, to Long Branch, New Jersey, <laughs> my hometown, where they took him to a cottage on the ocean where he got the cool ocean mm -hmm. breezes and where he lived, I think, for another couple of weeks before mm -hmm. he finally died. <laughs> um, so that's kind of a strange segue to perhaps <laughs> <laughs> Uh, great story. But anyway, we have some time for any audience questions or comments, and then maybe we'll end with the want bone. How about that? Okay. So th that's the one poem that uh, Robert is, his own poem that he will share. So um, Michael has a microphone. So if there are any thoughts or questions or anything? No, yes, no. Yes. Jessica, maybe um, Michael? Uh, or just say it. We, I'll repeat it. Okay, fine. Can you? Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. But <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the aspects that's intertwined inextricably. Yes. The Robert Hayden poem, as the, she says, is it's as though it's illustrated by the Turner mm -hmm. of the slave ship. And that, that contrast that you can burn on the water, it, it's on some level, it seems contradictory, but it happens. And uh, you know, we have all the refugee catastrophes, and I don't remember one of them being that, but these tremendously in, inadequate overcrowded boats, um, and transmutation of fire, that these, it makes you think about the, the four elements. Uh, I was trying to just stall while the microphone came down. It would have been great to have it, so I didn't mean to discourage you from bringing it down if you have one that works. Somebody back there, yeah, gentlemen, near the back. No, I don't, I don't think I need it. Um, Greece and Flemish are both languages of the sea, hmm. which works well with mm -hmm. with Leif. Uh, I think in German, Leif and Leiden also work with light. 
which is kind of a, an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, um, on, I have lived on the ocean, blessed enough to be living right on the ocean for more than 40 years, North Shore. Um, and there's a castle on the ocean, actually, part of four castles, if, if you... Maybe if you stand it. up, if we can't get oh. a microphone. I'm not hearing you now. Oh, is this a little better? I think she has the mic. Oh, is this? yeah. Okay. But go ahead. Talk <laughs> into it. Okay. okay. <laughs> so the uh, part of um, uh, the wonderment of walking along the ocean or being and sitting and just being on a rock for hours uh, at Singing Beach in Manchester or uh, Good Harbor or, or all the kinds of beaches, especially the ones with rocks right there and trees and the, and the, the surf, the, the actual action happening most of the time in a way that makes you feel better because it is producing ozone, which is good. People think ozone, that's bad. No, yeah. the ozone hole is bad. We need more oxygen. And it only lasts for about 50 to 100 feet away from the crash of the foam that makes the ozone. Because it's so powerful, it combines chemically within yards. And, um, but still, the part about the ocean co uh, minerals, and there's still some oxygenation in it, so when you go, bring a couple of gallons uh, with you know, lids and soak your feet at night in them, <laughs> and you'll have, you'll have a, a taste of that. Uh, but that's part of the reason um, the oxygenation ma makes us all, we start breathing in, in, in a very much more relaxed way walking. So that's huh. all part of this movement. I wonder if that should be related to where uh, we came up with this uh, video that you're saying. This actually is, comes with audio. And it's something that people use. You can get it. You can download it on the web for insomnia. Mm -hmm. This is designed to help you sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, although some of the images we've had in the poems here, maybe not, but what she's saying about <laughs> oxygen, it, do, it does make sense that in some intuitive way, like me being sure that uh, my uh, little cuts and bruises will be healed, um, this apparently, for a lot of people, looking at this and even more hearing the audio that we, Deborah, wisely cut out, mm -hmm. uh, it helps us relax. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a way that the, our, our ideas about the substance and our sentiments about what the substance is and does kind of come configured together. And it's difficult to sort of detach them, right, and sort of hold them up to historical or analytic scrutiny. Thank you. Uh, there, there's uh, the ocean is is so unknowable. Is so the scale is so grand, mm. um, so imposing. But at the same time, there's such a tradition in poetry and literature of people uh, writing about very personal mm. relationship with the sea, almost lover to lover. Could you, um, to you could you sort of uh, speak to that that for a moment? Well, I think Shakespeare. In a way, even, even the Robert Hayden is in, in, encompassed by that idea that it's changed to something rich and strange. And that can be erotic. And I think rich and strange is what you're saying is the unknowable part, that it's so rich that it can yield images of healing, images of horror, images in eros ternos of betrayal. It can be sexy. It can be fatal. It's even in the Bishop poem comical as well as mysterious. And Shakespeare's got it with into something rich and strange. That it is rich and that can, almost anything could be there in the whole spectrum of emotion or thought. And uh, it is strange. You will never get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. You will never, those two senses of sound. Mm -hmm. You can hear it, and you can put a chain down it Mm -hmm. and say it's full fathom five or Mark Twain, but you will not sound it in that full sense of understanding it. That, that's right. 
But it's interesting too, that kind of relay between the kind of enormity and the intimacy. So I think just thinking about the seashell and that kind of fantasy of hearing the sea in the seashell, which is, <laughs> which is this sort of way of bringing this immensity into, in, into intimacy, right? That the, the idea is that, that somehow you've yeah. captured it in, at the scale of your own auditory yeah. experience. Yeah. And that produces this kind of derangement of, is that wonderful? Is that scary? I mean, it's also, is it, a, is it whispering to you? Is it a lover? Is it telling you secrets? Or, or what, right? Yeah. So. How much of that is left over from our experience in amniotic fluid? I don't remember anything about that from my own. <laughs> I remember it perfectly. It wasn't like it wasn't like it at all. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's, it's interesting that yeah. kind of. That, that's another interesting symbolic the, the, relay, yeah. right? And, and the immersion and the, yeah. Mm -hmm. The mother, right? Yeah. Maybe two more. Um, this gentleman here, and then there's one more, and then we'll conclude. Um, as, a, as a scientist who came here after a day yesterday spent on a National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council. Um, on this fateful day, I came with the impossible wish that you gentlemen, with your great depth of knowledge of artistic expression and human feeling, might be able to offer some resources or some way to go about looking in this kind of material for a way to help us, the kind of people who are in this room, link humanity with this immensity rather than allowing people to continue to try to separate us mm -hmm. from it, which seems to be a global ailment, mm -hmm. probably fatal if we don't figure out a way to deal with it. Is there, I mean, uh, when you, if you think, if you go deep into, your readings and your writings and your thinking about the way that art connects us with nature. You know, any mm -hmm. glimmers of connection for people who don't see them the way folks in this room do? The same cultures that are presented as giving us uh, kind of a siblinghood with natural things that we, it's a family, us and the fish and the ocean and the birds. Those same cultures on the smaller scale than the technological culture do terrible things. So I'm, I'm, I would be uneasy I understand what you're saying, I think. And I would like to think that the process of the process of light giving in civilization is going to rescue us. But it's there's a lot of ambiguity in it. And um it's probably going to take a lot of political will <laughs> and um, as to this thing of uh, apparently it's even technically and legally impossible to withdraw from the Paris Accords. It takes three years. But the spirit of it, the spirit of it which <laughs> Exxon and G are saying, no, don't do that um, on some level the fact that we're just using these grunts to communicate with one another. And I, I know what you're talking about. I know what the guy who said the sea is mysterious is talking about. I know when the woman could say to me, there's that painting in the MFA, there's that Turner, and uh, Robert Hayden can make me think about the Middle Passage and slavery. Um, I think of when Stefan said things we call nature. It's one thing. You know, this is air and little grunts that we've turned.
turns out, this primate uses, deploys these very well. I think it's an open question whether we can catch up in time. And um, poetry is fundamental. You know, it's like building and funeral rituals and educational rituals. It's fundamental, but it's not going to cure us by itself. <laughs> I'll go that far. Yeah, and I, I think that um, I, I feel sort of traumatized and not very hopeful kind of right this day, right? So it's hard to sort of immediately yeah. figure out the answer, you know, a way to think through what you've presented, although I'd love to turn it back to you. It's like, no, science can do it. You guys do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, now, now that Donald Trump has declared that the ocean is bad for America um, <laughs> and has officially declared that the heat, uh, heat hell on Earth is kind of the inheritance that he wishes to bequeath to the planet, you know, I sort of, I was, I was, I was telling Robert that I was looking at um, Edgar Allan Poe's The City and the Sea poem today, in which, which is about a seaside city over which death presides, but which the sea finally reclaims. And because I think I was raised as a punk rocker, I was just like, this is the kind of darkness that yeah. I feel like is, I'm just going to indulge in for today, where you know, the, 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 I wrote bits of this poem down where the, the, um, the, uh, the waves have now a redder glow, the hours are breathing faint and low, and then, and then the ocean sort of sinks human civilization as this kind of getting humans back for their um, mistakes in the stewardship of the world around us. Yeah. So that's exactly the opposite of what you asked. Something that's not, well, no, like, yeah. you know, so it's not a yeah, hopeful yeah, thing. It's just right, like, right. But you know. in a way, that dystopia mm -hmm. is part of an old idea that there are forces in nature that will heal us by destroying us. Mm. They will take, it will be taken care of. They'll be, you know, will be turned to pillars of salt. Or we're, you know, we're, we'll be, the, the earthquake quake will destroy us. Right. So there's a corrective. And this is a different anxiety. Mm. Mm. This is that no, we're going to mess up the ocean. Right. It's not going to. Yeah. So that it's an old right. dystopia and a relatively reassuring one compared to what we're talking about. But yeah. but now the poisoned ocean is us. Uh, I I did an event a little bit like this where we read poems and mm. about nature in um, Marin County in California, and we had a, a an attorney a very effective litigator um, who worked for some very powerful, very wealthy environmental foundation there. And he had extraordinary statistics about how much California has improved these things. Mm. Mm. That the per capita energy use in California has gone down drastically. And um, renewable energy even before it gets improved, as much as it's getting improved in places like this about every 10 minutes, it already is so much cheaper than fossil fuels. And I'm not abandoning poetry, but I don't want poetry to be a kind of benign, mm. sacerdotal, it'll be OK. Uh, it's going to depend upon science and politics which in turn do depend upon fundamental things like art. Uh, but you have to follow and through language. all the way, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. and language yeah. Was, would be my example. Um, to go back to the amniotic fluid, uh, I have learned that if you have an a, a infant grandchild, the child will curl up against you and act comforted or soothed exactly the same way if you sing to it or recite poetry to it. <laughs> and it has to do with I think we've evolved to appreciate sound that comes from the voice box very much, and rhythm is very powerful. And uh, they say that even uh, prenatally, we are starting to respond to language. And uh, so it's fundamental, but the end of the gesture has to be accomplished too. Mm -hmm. And if anybody here who's a great environmental scientist, uh, uh, Mr. Macron wants you in France. Right. So I, I think this, because um, we're just, I just want to be cognizant of time, I would like to ask you to read uh, your poem. Slightly embarrassing, but no. look, I'm mastering it. To the point. I have it by heart.
heart, but I should be looking at it anyway. The want bond. The tongue of the waves told in the earth's bell. Blue rippled and soaked in the fire of blue. The dried mouth bones of a shark and the hot swale gaped on nothing but sand on either side. The bone tasted of nothing and smelled of nothing. A scalded, toothless harp, uncrushed, unstrung. The joined arcs made the shape of birth and craving, and that welded open shape kept mouthing, oh. Ossified cords held the corners together in groined spirals, pleated like a summer dress. But where was the limber grin, the gash of pleasure? Infinitesimal mouths bore away. The beach scrubbed and etched and pickled it clean. But oh, I love you, it sings. My little, my country, my food, my parent, my child. I want you, my own, my flower, my fin, my life, my lightness, my O. <laughs> So, um, thank you so much, both of you, for a wonderful dive, reading, conversation.